Hello! In this video, you're going to learn how to use the CSS property font family and how to build a font stack. So there's a lot of stuff online about font stacks, but I've found that beginners build their stacks kind of randomly and it's just not a good way to do it. So let's do it the right way to begin with. And so I'm starting out with a CSS file that has one font family, one font stack defined for the body. So that's going to be all the paragraphs, all the lists, really everything on the page, except the one set of things that I've overridden, and that is the headings. So this is a typical way to style a page. It's not the only way, but to have uh, one font family defined for all your headings and everything else on the page has a different font family. And the efficient way to do that, everything else, is to specify that font family in the body only once because everything inherits from the body, right? So if you have articles and sections and lists and more things on this page, you don't have to specify the font family again. They will all inherit this stack, except for the one thing that I've changed. And I do have H3s on this page, although you can't see them, they're at the bottom. So the first thing to understand is that I have selected two fonts from Google Fonts. This is covered in a separate, different video. And when you have Google Fonts in your CSS, you must load those fonts, and that is typically done in the HTML in a link tag. And you'll see that I am loading here both Oswald and Arvo from Google Fonts, and below that link is the link to your own style sheet. That's important because you don't want your style sheet to load and the Google fonts haven't come in yet, right? Because then they won't show up on your page. So what you're seeing right now is you're seeing Arvo, which is a Google font for everything on the page, and you're seeing Oswald, another Google font, for only the headings. Now Google Fonts gives us a way to pretty much ensure that the user is going to see the font that we want. If we don't use Google Fonts and we don't supply fonts in multiple formats for the user to download when they come to our site, we don't know exactly what fonts they're going to get because the fonts then would come from the user's own computer. The browser would load fonts depending on what the user had. And so I want to demonstrate that because we can't always be certain that the Google fonts are going to load. And also, sometimes you don't want to use Google fonts. You just want to make a simple page with simple fonts, but you still need to think about the font stack. So, there we go. Uh, so what happens to this page if the Google fonts have not loaded or I decided not to have any Google fonts. I'm going to save my CSS and I'm going to reload and the page would look like this. And it's not bad. It's different. It's maybe not exactly the sort of feeling or flavor that you wanted, but it's okay. Um, however, I need to show you that even though you might think that we are now seeing Cambria for the body and Calibri for the heads, we're actually not. We're not seeing those fonts, and why not? Well, if I look at the Mac built-in app called Fontbook, and there's something like this on Windows also, I look at all the fonts, notice I've selected all the fonts, all the fonts on my machine, and I look and there is no Cambria or Calibri there. So that means that I am not seeing those fonts that I specified. What am I seeing instead? Well, if I took off Cambria and Calibri, 
leaving only the generics, the CSS font generics, which are values that ensure that at least it's going to be serif and sans serif. If I change that in my CSS and reload, watch carefully, there is absolutely no change at all. And that's because since my computer does not have Cambria or Calibri, those fonts, I don't have them, what loaded instead were these generics at the end. So this is one of the reasons that you want to make sure that the type of generic you choose perfectly matches the kind of font you wanted in the first place. So if I wanted sans serif headings, I've got them even though it's a generic font. And if I wanted everything else on the page to be a serif font that was a lightweight font that's readable in paragraphs, well, I've got that, so it's not so bad. Now, some of you might be wondering about the generics that are not these two. And I would say about 99% of the time, you're going to put the generic at the end of your font stack as either serif or sans serif. And I'm going to show you why. I've made a simple page to demonstrate to you what the font generics are for each of the five um, generics that exist in the CSS specification. And cursive and fantasy are pretty unreliable. Now, if you wanted to use a particular curvy, scripty kind of font, that would be okay. But do you really want to put cursive as the generic when this is what it's going to look like if people don't have that font? And do you really want to put fantasy as the generic when this is what it's going to look like if they don't have the font that you picked? And remember, these are only the defaults on my computer. Your computer, your phone, your friend's phone might have a completely different look for this generic. Now, one thing you can count on is when you use monospace, you will get a monospace font that's quite nice for code, right? If you're, if you're putting code as part of what's on your web page, monospace is a really good thing to use for that. But in general, we're not going to use the monospace fonts for anything other than code. So this is a little digression on the font generics, but you should be aware that for the most part, when you assign the generic as the last value in your font stack, you are going to 99% of the time use either serif or sans serif and not one of the other three. So let's return to my font stacks as they originally were. And if the Google fonts load, the page looks like this. But if I am a typical Mac user in 2018, I don't have Cambria and I don't have Calibri. So how am I as a web developer going to figure out which fonts to supply in my font stack that will be seen by most Mac users? Well, you say you have a Mac, you can just look on your own Mac. Not everybody's Mac is the same. Not everybody has the same fonts. So one option we have, rather than just picking some random font stack some, from somewhere on the web, is we can look at this website, cssfontstack.com, which is recommended in Robbins, and we can say, well, if I'm picking out a serif font and I want to make sure a lot of Mac users have it, I can look at this page and say, oh, more than 97% of Mac users have Georgia. And in fact, so do 99% of Windows users. Um, maybe I don't like Georgia. Maybe I feel like it looks too fat. What about this one, Dito? 93% hmm. of Mac users have it. And I don't have to worry about my Windows users because Cambria, well, maybe I have to worry because Cambria is only on 83% of Windows computers. So you see the kind of decisions I'm making. I'm looking at the percentages on this website for serif fonts and I'm saying, 
well, you know, what might work? What might be a good substitute for my serif font, which is my paragraphs? And I'm going to try Dito. Uh, I'm going to look at Dito. If I come back to my CSS, I take off Arvo because I don't want that to show up. And I put up Dito, Dito as the first one. So then, and the comma always goes after the quotation marks, remember. So I save that. I go back to my page and I reload. So now my paragraphs will be in this Dito font, I think. Well, it looks nice. It's all right. Um, checking though, do I actually have Dito on my machine? I do. So you want to make sure that the font you think you're testing is actually on your computer when you're testing it. So you want to open up this font app within your computer and have a look, right? So if you can live with Dito, okay. Uh, I had one other one I wanted to try, and that was um, Georgia. So Georgia is uh, installed on almost all Macs and almost all Windows machines. So what if I put that in there instead and reload? And then I can say, well, maybe I don't like that as much. Maybe I thought the Dito looked better. Maybe I like the Georgia. Maybe I should keep Georgia as a possible default for people who don't have Cambria because remember only 83% of Windows users had Cambria. So now I start to make a font stack that will suit everybody and I have looked at all the fonts and I'm thinking they're all okay. So back to Dito for my paragraphs. It's like, I kind of like Dito, it's a nice font. And then the first one, the thing I want most people to get, the thing I want them to have, if they're online, if Google Fonts is working at that time, I want Arvo, right? So most people will see this for these paragraphs on this page. People who don't have Arvo, if they're on a Mac, if they have Dito, they will see that. If they don't have that and they're on Windows, they'll see this. If they have Cambria, that's what they'll see. And if they don't have any of these, but they do have Georgia, they'll see Georgia. And if they have none of them, the final thing is at least they will see the generic serif that's installed on their machine, whatever that is. This is a proper, suitable, professional font stack where all the possibilities are serif and granted, none of them quite look like Arvo, but at least they are all readable at a paragraph size and they all have serifs, so at least they're similar. The last thing I wanna show you is I wanna fix the font family stack, the font stack for the headings, because remember Calibri is also not on most Macs today. So if I look at the sans serif fonts, you'll see that Calibri is on about 83% of Windows machines, but only 38 or 39% of Macs. So Calibri is not going to help my Mac users. So I need to find something that'll be okay for Mac users, and I'm gonna try out Trebuchet MS. This is also a very popular font on both operating systems, so you're pretty well covered if you use it, but it has a particular look. It's not always the look that you would want. Sometimes you might want the rounder look of Verdana, but I think in this case, given that my headline font is Oswald, you see what I'm saying? Like what kind of flavor do I want for the page? What does Oswald look like as a font for headings? I'm gonna try Trebuchet MS. And one of the things you've got to be very careful about, and I'm going to copy and paste it so I don't mess it up, is you can't make any typos in your font families that you put into your declaration here. Because if you've spelled this wrong, the font won't show up. So let's see, save this and reload this. So this is what Trebuchet looks like uh, in my headings, for my headings. And granted, it's not terribly similar to Oswald. It's wider, 
Um, it's a little less dense, but uh, it's acceptable to me. And I want to show you another thing about it. When I said about the typos, yeah, sure, if you accidentally leave out the E, then you're not going to see trebuchet. You're going to see uh, the default. Now we're seeing whatever sans serif is on my computer. But uh, spell trebuchet right. Another common mistake that I see beginners make is they think something like this MS is not necessary. It is necessary. It's like a spelling error. So if I've taken off that MS, trebuchet is not the font I see. So you have to get the font name exactly right. You need to put it within single or double quotes when it has more than one word in the name of the font. And you've got to make sure you put the comma after the quotes or it won't show up. So at this point, I've got trebuchet and I know that, remember, it is on 99% of Windows computers and 97% of Mac computers. So I'm going to be pretty safe with trebuchet. And then I can put back my Google font. And now what you see in both cases is I've got a professional, well-tested, deliberately chosen font stack for my headings. And similarly, I have a suitable font stack for everything else on the page. And I only had to write each of these once, right? Because headings are gonna be this, everything else is gonna be this. So this is a way to build your font stack and how to specify your font family on your pages. Now, there's one more thing. Let's talk for just a second about how you pair these fonts. When I was picking Oswald and Arvo, I needed to make sure that they looked good together, that they were different enough from each other, that there was a reason to have two entirely separate font families, but also that they were complementary, that they had contrast, but not too much contrast. So it's a subtle thing and some people find it hard to figure out, other people find it easier. Um, if you're having trouble, if you haven't had any training in design or typography, there is some help for you out there. The first thing I would recommend very strongly is this page, which I've got linked in a document I'll show you in a moment so that you can find this easily. And I'm also linking it in the video. So you could find the link down there. And what you want to see is how, let's go down, they've got great examples. So they talk about how do you figure out that things go together well or they don't. So this article gives you a lot of good examples. I'm fond of this one. I'm fond of this one. This is quite nice. So you want to study some examples and you want to think about how do I pair two fonts together if I'm going to use two font families at all. You could just use one on your whole page. So I hope you understand how to build your font stacks carefully, deliberately, professionally, not randomly. I hope you understand how to pick fonts, how to make sure that the font you think you're looking at on your computer is really the font you're looking at because we don't all have the same fonts. And I hope you can learn to control typography reasonably well when you're building your web apps.